this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, again in collaboration with my brother in Christ from the United States of America, Tom Fress, from the wonderful ministry Inquisition Update, who you know already, because we have done 30 broadcasts in this reading, End Time Delusion, the book by Steve Wahlberg. This is the 31st session we are going to go through today, and I want to very warmly welcome Tom to the broadcast. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? Hello, Yerk, and hello to the listeners. It's very nice and, uh, to be here. I hope my voice holds out. <laughs> Plagued with laryngitis again. So. Okay. And still, I should say, I, it's, it's become a, a constant problem. I just can't seem to find a solution to it. So anyway, uh, well, I'll do the best I can. Well, that's why I will take over the reading. Then you only need to concentrate on the uh, on the comments, Tom. That's already a little bit less, right? <laughs> <laughs> sharing sharing the workload eh? yeah. okay we are on page 85 in the PDF as you can see we are in the uh, in the uh, chapter that is called putting the pieces together we started that already last time and now we are going to continue with putting the pieces together from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 we already read the first uh, six uh, parts the first six um, quotes here. We will only need to go into point 0.7. That's why I'm going to repeat all the points because we are going into 2 Thessalonians 2 and how 2 Thessalonians 2 is giving us the assurance that the Antichrist was already known in the time of Paul because that's what's it all about. That's about putting the pieces together. Putting the pieces together of the prophecies of Daniel, the prophecies of Paul and the prophecies of John in the Apocalypse or Revelation, whatever you want to call it. We are here in 2 Thessalonians 2. Seven points. The first six we already spoke about. I'm going to repeat them and then we go into the seventh and further on in the reading. It says here, first, the Antichrist will rise as a result of a tremendous falling away, which is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, in the church before Jesus Christ returns to gather the faithful, which is written in verse 1. 
Secondly, Paul called this Antichrist the man of sin in verse 3. He called him the, the son of perdition also in verse 3. He called him the mystery of iniquity in verse 7 and quote unquote that wicked in verse 8. The mystery of iniquity was already working in Paul's day as we read in verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Yet it was being restrained as we read in verses 5 through 7 by the Caesars of the Roman Empire. After this restraint, we continue in point 4, was removed, Rome morphed in 476 AD, the Antichrist would be revealed in verses 7 and 8. Now, you see, fell, I put a little comment in there, I said morphed instead of fell, because we don't want to put the people on the wrong idea that Rome fell, as it is commonly taught in the world. Why? Because the prophecies of Daniel, especially chapter 2 and chapter 7, speak about four kingdoms, four heathen or pagan kingdoms that will rule the world from the time of Daniel's prophecy made in Babylon in the 6th century before Jesus came until the end of time. The very first one we identified as Babylon, the head of gold in the man uh, in the uh, metal man image. The head of gold was Babylon. The shoulders and arms of silver are the Medo-Persian Empire. The breast and thighs of uh, brass is the Grecian Empire. And the legs of iron with the feet of iron uh, treading down the miry clay is the Roman Empire. And there is no fifth empire. There is no Jewish empire or whatsoever people want to tell you. So the point is Rome did not fall in 476 AD. Rome changed from the pagan Roman Empire into the papal Roman Empire as we know it today. And I think it is important that we make that emphasis that Rome did not fall because, you know, you can open every history book that you want in the world today, that of course is written by the Jesuits, and they tell you Rome fell. But the Bible says that Rome will stand until Jesus Christ comes back. So when they teach in the history books that Rome fell in 476 AD when Jesus Christ must have returned, right? But he didn't. So I think it is important that we use the right explanation or the right expression of words and use to say Rome morphed or changed in 476 AD. Yeah? The pagan Roman Empire was destroyed and was replaced by the papal Roman Empire. And we also go later on in the book on exactly these things in the 6th and in the 7th century. And we're going to have an interesting um, discovery about what happened then. So in point 5 we read, this Antichrist would take his seat inside the temple of God, which we can read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, which is the church. The temple of God is the church. The Bible says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, quote, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And also in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21, where the Bible says, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Point 6. He will operate until the bright, visible, glorious return of our Lord. He, the Antichrist, who is the Pope of Rome, the Antichrist is not only the Pope of Rome, he is the self-styled King of Kings and Lord of Lords in this world. He is the Caesar of this world, and you know that in the discourse of Pope Pius IX from 1853, he said, the Caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone obedience and fidelity are due. So he took over the position of the Caesars, the Pope, and he will operate until the bright, visible, glorious return of our Lord. Since that didn't happen, Rome did not fall, Rome was changed. 
And point seven we read, When Jesus Christ comes, he will destroy the Antichrist and gather his faithful people who have not, quote-unquote, fallen away from the truth of his word, which we, which we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1, 3, 8, and 10 through 12. Tom, any concluding remarks on Second Thessalonians chapter 2 so far from your side? No, I, I, I think you covered it very well, and the point needs to be reiterated that the, the fourth and final beast described in the Bible is the Roman Empire. That's the fourth and final Gentile uh, empire that will rule the world and will be ruling the world when Christ returns. And the head of that world empire is the papacy, just as the Caesars were the head of the old Roman Empire, the papal Caesar is the head of the holy Roman Empire, and it will be destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming and the spirit of his mouth. And uh, you've made the point very well. The Roman Empire did not fall, otherwise Daniel is a liar. And we know Daniel is no liar. And uh, the, the, the kingdom that will replace the fourth and final empire in the world, the Roman Empire, will be the kingdom of Christ. And so uh, this is the last time. It has, been, it has been the last times ever since Jesus, because Rome was in power when, when Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. When Jesus was born, it was a Roman power that tried to kill him in his crib. Okay? That same fourth and final beast power is still in power today. It has the same power today that it had then. It's Roman. It's centered in Rome. It's the persecutor of the saints, the, dis the persecutor and counterfeiter of Christ, it is the deceiver of the whole world, and it will be destroyed when Christ returns. So we, we don't need to re repeat this, 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 this historical mantra, this false historical mantra that the Roman Empire fell. It never fell, and uh, it's still in power today. It still rules over the kings of the earth. It still persecutes God's people. It still tries to replace Christ in the world and uh, it's going to be destroyed. We have that we have that promise from from heaven from our Savior that he will destroy this man of sin when he returns. And until that day, we need to be praying against him. We need to be identifying him so other people can can recognize uh, the antichrist in the papacy. And uh, Everywhere you look, there, there are people who talk about a future Antichrist, as though the Antichrist is not in the world. And that's why the world is so blind to the role that the papacy plays and has played throughout the entire Christian era against God's people. And his domineering uh, uh, assertion of power over the kings, the governments, and the militaries of the world. You cannot make sense of history. You cannot make sense of anything that has happened in the last 1,500 years in the world unless you know who the Antichrist is. And that's why people are so confused today, because they believed a lie. They've been taught a lie from conceivably the most reliable people on the earth. They're pastors. Well, we learn now that they're not pastors. They're deceivers, okay? The Bible calls them hirelings. They work for their hire. And how do you maintain a, a job? You tickle the ears of your people, and that's what they do, okay? They're deceivers. They're in the business of deceiving. That's how they stay in business. If they were to tell us the truth, most of the people would walk out of the churches. They don't want to hear the truth. But we're going to tell the truth no matter if it makes us the enemy of God's people. Okay? You're going to have to get over it. You're going to have to learn the truth. 
and I don't mean to be roughshod over the people. They're God's people, and I have to love them the way God loves them, and that is to tell them the truth no matter what. And that is the truth. Your pastors are lying to you. They've been lying to you for 250 years, and they're going to continue this futurist lie, try to keep you believing in a future Antichrist so that you never recognize who the historical, prophetic, and biblical Antichrist has been for the last 1,500 years. Because if the whole world knew who the Antichrist is, then we could save the people from being deceived by him. And we could liberate our governments from serving him. That's the function of the church, the body of Christ, to take the Antichrist off of Christ's throne and put Christ on his throne where he belongs. But until the world comes to the truth, and if they, if they insist on believing a lie and, and continuing in this futurist delusion, there won't be anything righteous happen in the world until Christ returns. Maybe you could call me impatient, but that's no crime. I want God's people to know the truth. The way God's people knew the truth before the Protestant Reformation, all the way back to the days of Paul, they knew who the Antichrist was. They prayed against him. They identified his identity. They identified his satanic works, his persecutions, his control over the kings of the earth, his false doctrines, his false miracles, his false gospel, and that was their career. They preserved the, the gospel truth. Jesus is the Christ, but then they made sure everybody knew the papacy is the Antichrist, so they would never be deceived, never fall under his sway, never be under his control. And that's why the papacy's control always had to be forced upon God's people. They never came willingly to the Roman Catholic Church. They were oppressed, forcibly converted to the Roman Catholic Church, many of them to save their own lives, and most of them refused, and they burned at the stake. Forcibly converted. On their, yes, forcibly converted. What the, did I say? Did I make a faux pas? No, no, you said forcibly yeah. converted, and that's a very good point. Yeah. I just wanted to reiterate a little bit on that. You make the yeah. very good point. The Roman Catholic Church never proselytizes with the Bible. No. They convert no. by arms. It is right. convert or die. It is not That's convincing the people that the Bible, the word of God, legitimatizes them. Because when you hold the Bible against the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, you'll see in a jiffy that the Roman Catholic Church is not the church of Jesus Christ on this earth. Right. So that's why they take people or convert people by force. That's a very right. important point that Tom makes here. We That's Christians, we go out in the world, we have the Bible in our hands, we bring the gospel to the people, and we want to convert the people by telling them from the word of God. Rome puts a gun into your head and says, you're going to eat the Jesus cookie or else. Right, Tom? That's right. That's right. That's, that's what... That's what uh, that's why there are so many martyrs in God's house, because they would not eat the Jesus cookie. They would not attend the Roman Catholic Mass. They would not pretend that there's anything holy in the Roman Catholic Church, many of them at the cost of their own lives. And uh, Rome will never tolerate the truth. And as you, you're going to find, if, if the truth is, prevails in the United States of America, we're going to find the United States government against us. They're going to call us hate speech. They're going to call us uh, uh, dividers and, and uh, unpatriotic and uh, potential uh, threat to our, our so-called uh, uh, national security. And one thing or another, they're going to use the, the civil power of our tax-paid government to persecute the saints of the Most High. George W. Bush happen. said it right already. The United States. Why? Because it's no longer a Protestant nation. 
It is a Roman Catholic nation. Even the Protestant churches, when they maintain their Protestant name, their Protestant denomination, they teach Roman Catholic theology, Roman Catholic uh, eschatology. And that Roman eschatology is futurism. It denies that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and it says the Antichrist is just one single individual that doesn't come until just before Christ returns, and by the way, we're all going to be raptured out before he gets here. What a load. What a cockamamie load of hooey. That's what it is, straight from the pit, straight from the Roman Catholic Vatican. And it's contrary to everything God's people have taught for 1,800 years. It's contrary to everything God's people have taught all the way back to Paul. And it's time for this baloney to come to, a, to an end with prejudice. Back to you, Jörg. George W. Bush made that point already a few years ago after the um, attacks on 9-11-2001. He said, you are either with the terrorists or you are with us. That's so right. If and you, have, if you have... don't adhere to the meaning, the teaching, and the rules given by the government of the United States of America, you are against the government of the United States of America, and that makes you a terrorist. And there's a very interesting little uh, little video um, uh, quote. I'm, you maybe remember, uh, I, I don't know if you saw that, Tom, but maybe the viewers remember, um, that I did a video in Hour of the Truth about Georgetown University. If you haven't seen that, in Hour of the Truth, it's uh, Georgetown University. It's in the title. It's very interesting to watch. And there's a little excerpt from a uh, former Marine, I think, who says that people like Bible-believing Christians are the enemy. And they need to be rooted out. Just watch right. that little video. It's in Georgetown yeah. University. That is the Jesuit University in the United States of America. Right? There is all this wrong teaching coming from. Yeah? And they are in charge. And they already call biblical fundamentalists, which Tom and me are, and probably a lot of you who are watching this video too, terrorists. That's right. We have the current the current president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, uh, has said words to the effect, "We will no longer tolerate tolerate anti-Roman Catholic rhetoric, anti-Roman Catholic bigotry," and. Uh, that's just another name for Protestantism. If most people would just think about it for a minute, anti-Roman Catholic bigotry is Protestantism. And by the way, just in case you didn't know, the word bigotry is defined by someone who holds strong beliefs. Okay? It has nothing to do with uh, a, a vicious connotation that has been placed upon that word. Bigotry is, is a benign term, okay? You're a bigot when you think strongly about something or another. A fundamentalist, a strong, in other words. A strong opinion. Uh, a, a, a zealot would, would be another word that would... But nonetheless, the point, is, the point is, I don't want to lose the point, the President of the United States has put down the gauntlet He's not going to tolerate any Roman Catholic bigotry, any anti-Roman Catholic bigotry. Now, that's where persecution of Protestantism starts. Government-sanctioned, taxpayer-funded religious persecution against anti-Roman Catholics by whatever denominational description. Now, that means that you can't go throughout the world calling the Pope the Antichrist. They're not going to tolerate that anymore. That's at least the word from Washington, D.C., under this Jesuit-trained uh, president. And uh, when, when, when one speaks out against the papacy, which God's people have always done, and need to they do. Will find themselves, they will find themselves on the receiving end of the persecution that God's people have always suffered. Why? Because they are bigots for Jesus, 
and bigots against the Antichrist. Okay? Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist, and we don't waffle on that. That's, that's the basic uh, of the two planks of, of true Bible-believing Christianity. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. We don't leave anybody in question about who the Christ is, and we don't leave anyone in question about who the Antichrist is. If we do, we're not serving Christ. And I choose to serve Christ the rest of my dying day. And uh, I've been deceived by futurism all my life. Everyone who was near and dear to me preached futurism. I didn't know anything about historicism. I've been lied to my whole life by the people I loved and respected the most. And uh, I've got nothing to lose. And I'm going to lose it all if I have to. But futurism is a dead letter. Futurism is a diabolical lie conjured up by the demon on the Vatican Hill. And if God's people believe it, they're going to be deceived. And they're going to be punished. They're going to find themselves worshiping a false Christ. That's what the whole purpose of futurism was designed to do. Back to you, York. Yeah, to present to them another Christ, just as Jesus warned that he was sent in his father's name and someone else, and he was not received, and uh, there will come somebody else in a name the father has not given him, and him they will receive. Jesus Christ said it already 2,000 years ago. We should listen to Christ. That means we should read and understand the Bible. Another important word from the Bible is, of course, putting the pieces together from Revelation 13, the book of Revelation. So we go into chapter 13, and what does it have to say about the Antichrist? Point 1. The Antichrist is also called the beast in verse 2. This quote-unquote beast is the same thing as the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 that we already spoke about. And thirdly, just like the little horn, this beast would have, quote, a mouth speaking great things, unquote, in verse 5. And this beast would make, quote, war with the saints, unquote, as we read in verse 7. Fourthly, a beast in prophecy represents a powerful kingdom on earth, as we can read in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. Fifthly, this beast will eventually have worldwide influence and control. There is your quote-unquote new world order. And verse 6, this beast will continue until the end of time. See Revelation chapter 19 verse 20 where the Bible says, quote, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The Bible I'll reveals... Tell you, I'll tell you who the false prophet is. I'll tell you who, who, who the false prophet is. It's the one that says Jesus did not come in the flesh. And you know who that is? It's the one who says the 70th week of Daniel is future. That's the false prophet. Always pointing the finger to the same person here in the picture. That's right. That's right. It's time for us to know the truth and to repent of our folly. Yeah, and speaking the, the truth speaking the truth will not make you popular. Will not right. earn you friends. <laughs> right. No, it's you will rather be you. cast out and pointed at and be stoned or crucified or things like that. But we have to suffer for the word of Christ, don't we, Tom? It's, and that uh, is a suffering that is worth the suffer. Jesus told us that's the way it would be. In this world we will have tribulation. Yeah. That's what he said. And he didn't speak of a seven-year tribulation, Jim, before the end of time. <laughs> he 
He spoke of all the Christians all throughout the Christian era in the last 2,000 years that they will have yeah. in this world tribulation and persecution. The Bible reveals a few more pieces to this Antichrist jigsaw puzzle, but this is enough for now. So what are we looking for when it comes to the real Antichrist of prophecy? In a nutshell, we are looking for an Antichrist that was starting to work in the time of Paul, but was being restrained by the pagan Roman Empire. It would grow in strength in the wake of a massive quote-unquote falling away from Jesus inside the Christian Church and would be quote-unquote revealed unrestrained after the Roman Empire changed in 476 AD into the Papal Roman Empire. It would be centered somewhere in Western Europe, would become self-exalting and would even usurp the authority of God inside his temple, that is, that is within Christianity. That's what the author said. Now, why did I mark this green? Is this, why is this marked untrue? Well, because the Roman Catholic Church may have developed from Christianity in ancient times, but it fell away, as we can read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And now, it is not Christianity anymore. It maybe has its roots in Christianity. I would never deny that, because that would say make, making the Bible a liar. But it is not Christianity anymore, since the falling away came. And that falling away, for some people, started in 321, for some people started in 538, for some people started in 606. That is not important when it started. The point is, now, in these days, the falling away has long been done, the Antichrist has long been revealed, as we just spoke about that, and that made that church not a Christian church anymore. But it stands for everything that Christianity does not stand for. Right, Tom? Is that correctly explained? It's absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's called Christianity. It calls itself Christianity. But it's a system of works, not grace. It, it's, a, it's a church of sacraments that the Roman Catholic must participate in if he wants to go to quote-unquote heaven. And it, it, it's, its ultimate authority is the Pope, the man of sin, the son of, of perdition, the only one in the church that has the power to interpret Scripture according to Roman Catholic dogma. Can you imagine that? When Jesus said that he was going to go away, that he was going to send a comforter after he went away, he was going to send a comforter that would teach us all things. That was the Holy Spirit. But the Pope claims to be the only one who can interpret Scripture. That's blasphemy of blasphemies. That's usurping the role and the purpose and the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. He is a blasphemer of the Holy Spirit. That makes him the enemy of God. Just by singly claiming the power, the sole power to interpret Scripture. And yet the world still asks, who is the Antichrist? You can thank your, te your teachers and your preachers and your pastors. This truth should have been clearly taught from your pulpits from the very first day of its erection, the first day of its construction. The first sermon ever preached in your church should have been this one. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist, the beast, the lawless one is that which claims to be the sole interpreter of Scripture in the place of and instead of 
the Holy Spirit who Jesus sent to teach us all truth. It, it's, it's embarrassing, isn't it? That, that we find ourselves believing such lies. You know, if I were to say to someone that I am the only one who has the, the ability to interpret Scripture, I'd be laughed into my grave. I would be ignored by anybody and everybody. Why is it that the papacy is taken so seriously? Unless Satan is deluding the people. What keeps the mouth of your pastor stopped with the truth? Why won't he just plainly tell you the, the plain and obvious truth? The biblical, historical, and prophetic truth. Why won't your pastor tell you what is plainly evident? from Scripture, history, and prophecy? That's a question you can't avoid. That's a question no one can avoid. That question will follow you everywhere you go from this day forward. Why won't your pastor tell you the truth? He cannot be held blameless. He cannot be trusted, not with your spiritual life. You may trust him to hand you the bait when you go fishing together, but that's as far as you can trust him. What a shame. What an abomination has taken place in the churches in this country. Are we going to continue to wonder why our country is gone to hell in a handbasket? We don't even know who the Antichrist is. That's an impossible situation, but it's real. It's the reality. It's the truth. It's the present truth. The American people, Christian though they may claim to be, don't know who the Antichrist is. How is that possible? You know the people who came over on the boat from Europe to this country and settled this country? They knew who the Antichrist is. That's why they came here, seeking freedom from kings and popes. The popes and the kings over which he ruled, they came to this country seeking freedom from kings and popes. Why are we so stupid today? We've been deceived, flat out deceived. There's no way to sugarcoat it. There's just no way to sugarcoat it. And I would be doing God's people a disservice to leave them in that deception. And I don't intend to be ashamed of my service to the Lord when he comes. I don't intend to hang my head in shame when my Savior stands before me and asks me to give an account what I did with the truth that he gave me when he, re when he made me realize the historicist truth, the truth that was believed by Bible-believing Christians from the first century all the way through the Protestant Reformation up until about 1805 or 1810 when the Jesuits infiltrated the Protestant and evangelical seminaries and colleges and universities and started preaching this cockamamie futurism. I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Look, I've got too much in my life to be ashamed of. I'm a flesh and blood human being like everybody else. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including me. But on this I will not fail to tell the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for that uh, very important little testimony there. 
an actual kingdom, the author continues to say, an actual kingdom, it would nevertheless have eyes like the eyes of a man, being man-led and man-centered, instead of being Christ-led and Christ-centered, which would make it Christianity, right? That's why it's not Christianity. Make large claims for itself, have, quote, a mouth speaking great things, unquote, become persecuting and deadly, making, quote, unquote, war against the saints. It would continue throughout Christian history and achieve global influence in the end times, yet finally be destroyed by the sin-consuming brightness of our Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. Those are undeniable facts from Scripture. Is such an Antichrist here now? You are about to discover irrefutable proof that for over 400 years the anonymous testimony of well-respected Protestant scholars Protestant historians and burnt to ashes Protestant martyrs has been most definitely. And this brings an end to chapter 14. And we will go into chapter 15, which is called Echoes of Forgotten Voices. It helps to understand the world that you're living in today when you look back in history and see how the world developed to the point where you are. Problem is, when history is forged with, means altered in a, <laughs> in a lying way, you have no way of determining where you stand today, you have no idea to see where you come from, and that is why it is so important to have a real knowledge of real history. Martin Luther when he went to the Diet of Worms, where this quote comes from, that we are going to read right here, was caught in a world of lies until, by God's grace, he was given the Bible and could see that he was serving Antichrist and not Christ. And then he took all his guts together, came to Worms, defended his point of view because his point of view was based on the Bible and he said, if you cannot convince me by pure reason or by the word of God, I cannot recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And as you know, I always have a little bit to add to these quotes. And in this regard, this is not for replacement, as so often before when reading this book, replace the quotes, but this is for confirmation. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, 8 and 9, we read, quote, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, it says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And that is, in other words, what Luther was saying when he stood there, convinced by the word of God, speaking the truth. The New Testament Church possessed, possessed, sorry, possessed, the New Testament Church possessed an all-consuming desire to exalt Jesus Christ and his incomprehensible once and for all sacrifice for the sins of the world. And we can see that in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 and 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. Especially Hebrews chapter 10, you are aware of that Tom and I are doing for the moment this reading 
of the confirmation of Jesus Christ being the full, uh, complete and uh, perfect fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And we are going to read New Testament verses to make that proof uh, steadfast. And we are reading for the moment there Hebrews chapter 10. So in verse 12 it says, But this man, speaking of Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down on the right hand of God. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The book of Acts reports CNN style, and I have to disagree with the author here, because I do not agree that anything in the Bible is in any way, shape or form to be compared to the Catholic News Network, a.k.a. CNN, uh, which uh, true name is, of course, um, what's it called, Tom? <laughs> Forget the true name of well, CNN. I, I, think it, I think it's actually Cable News Network. Cable News Network, yeah, yeah, right. And hopefully the listeners know what you mean, too. It, the Roman Catholic Church controls the press, yeah. no matter what initial we put on it. Go ahead. Yeah. And the CNN station is founded by Ted Turner, who is, in, uh, in my research, I think, a Knight of Malta. So, you know about that. So, I would not um, say that uh, the Book of Acts reports in CNN style, because I do not want to mix those two together. But the Book of Acts reports in a very own biblical style how the message of Christ's perfect righteousness and grace spread like an uncontrollable bushfire. It says brushfire, that must be bushfire. Throughout the Roman Empire. And therefore... Look in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 36 through 41, chapter 5, verse 14, and chapter 8, verse 4. And I wrote them down. I put them here in the comment in this, uh, in this document. And we're going to read from the King James Version the quotes mentioned. Acts 2, 36 through 41, quote, Therefore let all the house of Israel now know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts 5.14 says, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. And chapter 8 verse 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Unquote. As people trusted the merits of Jesus Christ for salvation, we read that in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, quote, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Rather than their own, quote-unquote, works, as we can read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, where it says, verse 8 and 9, quote, For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and the not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He forgave their sins, as we can read in Acts chapter 13, verse 38, quote, Be it be known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Purified their hearts in Acts chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, quote, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. 
and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. He forgave their sins, purified their hearts, and set their feet on the path to paradise. As a result of spirit-filled preaching, strong churches were raised up in the midst of an idol-worshipping, pleasure-crazy, Caesar-devoted world. The new Christian converts were taught to obey the Bible above the traditions of men. See Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, quote, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. <laughs> In opposition to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that says the Bible is not the pinnacle of, uh, of wisdom, but it is the Bible and traditions. And in question, if the Bible is not telling what the traditions of men say, we have to prefer traditions. That's official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. So, in direct country, uh, controversy to what it says here in uh, Colossians 2.8, after the traditions of men, the Roman Catholic Church says, no, the traditions of men stand on top. And to cherish, quote, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, unquote, as we can read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. They had discovered the only way to the Father, because there's only one way. The only way to the Father. Jesus Christ himself, as he says in John 14, 6, quote, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And we're taught to trust him implicitly. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, that we should be to the praise, that we should be to the praise of this glory who first trusted in Christ as the only mediator between Almighty God and the mankind family. See 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. They were also taught the importance of obeying the truth in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 where it says seeing ye have purified our your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently unquote. even if it meant opposition even if it meant ridicule or death they were willing to walk the narrow road which leads to life, as we can read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Because Jesus was precious to them, just as they were to him. But as the Christian train rolled down history's track, monumental changes took place. Just as Paul predicted, there came a tremendous falling away, as predicted in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, from the simplicity and purity of the gospel. Did, didn't you ever think about when you read the Bible how easy the Bible is to understand and how difficult it is to understand the Roman Catholic Church faith system? You have to study all the sacraments, you have to study all the encyclicals and papal bulls and all the teachings of the different councils all through the ages, all through, these, uh, through the centuries to understand what the Roman Catholic Church actually stands for, where the Bible is simple and pure in teaching the gospel. A ten-year-old can understand the King James Bible. Almost imperceptibly, false theories, man-made traditions and unbiblical practices slipped into the very heart of Christianity. Little by little, people lost sight of the beauty and loveliness of Jesus.
In the 4th century, during the time of Constantine, a large portion of the church compromised key Bible truths and decided to line up with the Roman state. Rejecting the humility of the meek and lowly, uh, of the meek and lowly one, as we can read in Matthew 11:29, where it says, quote, "Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls." So rejecting the humility of the meek and lowly one, church leaders sought pomp and worldly glory. Leaving the heavenly quote-unquote power of the Holy Spirit in Romans 15.13, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. They relied on the earthly power of politics and government. What are you relying on today? Earthly power, politics and government? Isn't the whole world for the moment with this COVID-19 corona stuff listening only to the earthly power, politics and government? Whoever turns to the Bible, whoever turns to put his trust in Jesus Christ, and they also, in history, recorded, relied on earthly power, politics and government. As even more traditions came in, Europe eventually became engulfed in the Dark Ages. In the 12th century, a monstrous tribunal was established called the Holy Office of the Inquisition, which was purposefully created to persecute and exterminate heresy by violence and not by persuasion. Making another time the point that we made earlier that the Roman Catholic Church converts by force and not by persuasion of the word of God using the Bible, but rather using a weapon in its hand. Its 600-year history, and <laughs> we could go on and on and on about discussing this, it is no question that the Inquisition went on from 1203 to 1805, but it carries on beyond that too. The, persec the, the persecution of the Inquisition is not out of this world. The office of the Inquisition, holy office of the Inquisition, may be changed its name to the office of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, but it still is working. It uses different matters, different methods, but it still is the Inquisition. Can but, I add a thought here, Yerk? Oh yeah, please. Sure, while, we're talking about, while we're talking about the Inquisition, very few people can remember what was talk, uh, taught uh, among the church uh, uh, members about this Inquisition that took place for 600 years. But suffice it to say that the Roman Catholic Church set out tribunals of priests to go from city to city to round up heretics to try them and then to torture them to make false confessions and then eventually kill them, okay? It, it was the bloodiest time in quote-unquote Christian history. And it's, it's one of the greatest blemishes on the history of the papacy, and they would like the world to forget it. And to make it go away, they pretended that this, 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 uh, 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 this, this, uh, a holy office of the Inquisition was done away with. They say that the, the Spanish Inquisition uh, continued till about 1865 or so, and, and then, it, then it just, uh, the world was uh, relieved of it, it, that it had just gone away, it doesn't exist anymore. Listen, you got to know the truth. Rome has never ceased to persecute God's people, and World, the world is too civilized now to permit the Roman Catholic Church to go around with official tribunals of priests to try to convict and then to kill God's people. And what they do now is they use wars, militaries, national and international military forces to perpetrate this persecution that used to be done 
by the Holy Office of the Inquisition. This idea that the Inquisition is over, that Rome no longer persecutes, is one of the greatest lies ever told. And when you see this country saddling up to go to war, you know there's another Holy Roman Inquisition, another Holy Roman Crusade to be taking place. And they already have established who's going to win and who's going to lose and, uh, and who's going to write the history about it. Every war is a papal proxy war. Every war is instigated and fought by the, to benefit the papacy and his, the extension of his control over the kingdoms of the earth. The goal of the Roman Catholic Church, the goal of the papacy always has been to rule the world by the volition of a single man the man of sin in Rome. And Rome's objective has never changed. Rome says it never changes, and in this respect, that is true. The Vatican set out to make the papacy the king of kings and lord of lords, and whenever a war is fought in this world, including wars fought, and especially wars fought by the United States of America, is fought for the purpose and the one purpose and one purpose only to extend the power and influence and control of the man of sin in Rome. Revelation chapter 13 talks about two beasts, a sea beast being that one of the papacy and a second beast out of the wilderness means the government of the United States of America. And the second beast causes the whole world to worship the first beast. So we have the representation of the, of the United States of America being the battle axe for the papacy, to conquer the whole world for the pope. And that's what the United States has done almost since its founding, and certainly since the founding of the federal government. So it's time for the American people to, to own up to the truth. And to recognize our hope is not in the United States of America. Our hope is not in the Constitution and Bill of Rights of the United States of America. They are going by the wayside. They were temporary inconveniences that the papacy had to tolerate. But those days are gone. And that means the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are gone. And papal tyranny is now going to rule the day. Okay? It was just an inconvenience the papacy had to tolerate for a while. Now this country has been conquered. It is Roman Catholic. Even the Protestants are Roman Catholic in their beliefs. Okay? Believing in a future Antichrist and exonerating the papacy. Now they think it's Christianity, and now they think to save this country it's got to become Christian, which means Catholic. Okay? That's what your pastors, it's another thing your pastor's not telling you from the pulpit of your churches. They're making America Catholic, okay? They, the, the, greatest, uh, the greatest advancement of Catholicization of the United States came with the teaching of futurism, okay? If you no longer believe the Pope is the Antichrist, the papacy is the Antichrist from the first Pope to the last Pope and every Pope in between, and you believe that the Antichrist is a single individual, then when, it, when, 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 the, when the United States becomes so wicked that you want to force Christianity to stop the, to, to curb this hellbound uh, direction that the country is, 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 is going in, then you're bound to elevate the papacy, and that's what it's all about. That's what futurism was designed to do, to destroy Protestantism, lock, stock, and barrel. And uh, we're all we, we're all pawns on the on the papal platform. We're repeating all the futurist lies. We're indoctrinating ourselves. Rome doesn't have to deceive us. We're deceiving ourselves by preaching futurism. Listen, the costs of preaching futurism in this country are incalculable. We're only scratching the surface. But certainly, if, if, if my powers of communication are anything, I've convinced you now beyond 
any alter, alternative belief that, that futurism is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And we are paying the consequence for believing this God forsaken lie. And uh, we've got to repent. We've got to do it quick. Or prepare for God's judgment. God's judgment is of going to fall on this country. There is absolutely no getting around it. For those who place all their hope in politics and government in this country, you've already chosen the losing side. Because Daniel plainly showed us in his prophecy that the kingdom that replaces the fourth and final beast on the earth, the Roman Empire, will be Christ's eternal kingdom. And when he returns, all the governments and all the kingdoms of the world, from the Babylonian through the Medo-Persian through the Grecian and the Roman, they will all be destroyed and ground to powder by the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. There won't be a shred of it left because it says, and they will be blown away with the wind. So if you put your hope in politics and you put your hope in the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights and our democratic or Republican way of life, you have deceived yourself. You have defied the scriptures and you need to repent. Our kingdom is not of this world. We have a king we have a constitution, and we have a kingdom. The king is Christ, the constitution is the Bible, and the kingdom is the entire universe. We are joint heirs with Christ, and we're about to come into our kingdom. And we've got to repent of every hope that we have in our national interests. No such thing as patriotism for an earthly kingdom in God's house. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom, for that much-needed elaboration today. Almost we come to the end of the broadcast because the sentence says, it's 600-year history, the history of the Inquisition, which Tom just spoke about in the beginning, is filled with gloomy portals, dark passages, locked doors, dungeons, blood-stained records, and extreme merciless, unmitigated tortures. And you just saw the pictures while Tom was telling you what it's all about. Incredibly, so-called Christians, Christians, yeah, multiple, uh, <laughs> um, plural, incredibly, so-called Christians murdered other Christians in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, this is where we're going to leave off our reading for today. It has been a little bit over an hour. It has been very important. I think very important things have been made the point of Jesus Christ and our Holy Father who is in heaven are no liars. The Father would not get his Son crucified for the sins of the world and leave us wanting the name of the Antichrist until a few years before he comes back. And how are you going to explain all the persecution, all the torture, all the inquisition during the last 2,000 years? There's no other way but saying the Antichrist has been here all along with us. We, who are living today, need to turn to our Bibles, read the Bibles, study the Bibles as the Reformers did, the people who came out of the Roman Catholic Church, which was the only um, established church in the Middle Ages, they found God through the Scripture, and they found Antichrist through Scripture, and they protested the Antichrist, even if it cost their lives. That's what we should do all day long. We should profess that Jesus the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. And you cannot teach the one without the other. When you preach Jesus Christ and you do not preach that the papacy is the Antichrist, you are responsible for what you are not saying. God will hold you responsible for that. You cannot plead ignorance because the Bible is clear in that regard. Very clear. 
There is an end time delusion. That's right. That's why Steve Wahlberg wrote this book and called it end time delusion. That's right. But as a Christian, you have the damn obligation to come out of that delusion because you are obliged to read the Bible when you call yourself a Christian and when you read the Bible with an open mind, there's no way that you can stay betrayed. With this, I want to give Tom the closing remarks of the broadcast today. Thank you very much for your attention, for your watching and listening and until next time, read your Bible and now Listen to Tom's closing remarks, please. By now, you're probably beginning to understand that uh, there's greatly more at stake than what's being put before us through the press, through our government, through our pulpits, and through every other source of uh, education. And uh, that's true. All these things are distractions from the truth. And we need to put away all the distractions, all the liars, all the ones who steer us into empty rabbit holes, all these false concerns, and, and start focusing on what really, really, really matters. And uh, that's what we've been talking about ever since we started reading this book, End Time Delusions by Steve Wilberg. What is more important? What this book is talking about or what the press is talking about? And sadly, what your pastor is talking about? I think the answer is obvious. So let's get serious about our faith. Let's get serious about what's coming. And let's start calling a spade a spade. Let's start telling the truth, even if it's costly, because there's everything at stake. This is no pipe dream. This is no hyperbole. This is no fortune telling. These are the facts of history the facts of the Bible, the facts of prophecy. And that concerns all of us. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. The President DeJoya's invitation started me thinking about the many similarities between Jesuits and News Corporation. Uh, but both the Jesuits and News Corporation attract highly talented people from all over the globe. Both the Jesuits and News Corporation like to challenge the status quo. And both the Jesuits and News Corporation have a reputation for independence and innovation. Of course, there are some differences. I don't want to discourage anyone who might be considering the priesthood. Uh, but I will tell you that at News Corporation, we don't insist on vows of poverty or chastity. Um, and as chief executive, I can tell you that I'm sometimes not sure about the degree of obedience either. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. DUP leader Ian Paisley was jostled, punched and then dragged out of the European Parliament today after interrupting a speech by the Pope. The disturbance came within seconds of the Pope starting to speak. Other Euro MPs responded angrily when Dr. Paisley heckled the Pope, saying he was the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... I call you to order and I ask you to stop this disturbance. For the second time, Mr. Paisley. For the second time, Mr. Paisley, I call you to order and I ask you to respect the dignity of this house. 
Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II Antichrist, a reference to the view supported by Archbishop Cranmer in Reformation times that by claiming to be God's earthly representative, popes have usurped the position of Christ. He remained unrepentant despite being accused of being a bigot. Well, let me say this, if the honor of Christ is at stake, I would put my whole political career on the line for the honor of Jesus Christ and his truth. I happen to be a Protestant by conviction, and I'm not going to sell my Protestant heritage.